Have you ever gone out on a dark night, no clouds, maybe not even a full moon, and looked into the sky and marveled at how many stars there were? Staring into dark space seems impressive to our human eye, but if you were to do the same thing with a Hubble Space Telescope for 15 days, this is what you would see on a patch of sky smaller than your pinky fingernail. Every smudge you see is a galaxy, roughly hundreds of millions of stars comparable to our own Milky Way galaxy. There's roughly 10,000 galaxies in this image, and if you extrapolate that across the entire sky, hundreds of billions of galaxies in our universe, each with hundreds of billions of stars, each of which could have a planetary system. That's a lot of planets to contemplate. And yet, for centuries, for millennia, the only planets we knew were in our own solar system. Galileo and Copernicus and Newton, they all did great things, but they had one system to work with, our own solar system. And while we've now sent spacecraft to go visit the giant planets, the distant planets, and see how diverse the planets are, giant, small, rocky, gaseous, their moons, fountains of ice and water, methane lakes, we're all one big family. All these planets formed at the same time, in the same place, from the same stuff. And so if we imagine now going to another time, another place with different materials, what could those planetary systems be like? Are they all going to turn out to be like our own? Or is the same diversity we see in our solar system just the tip of the iceberg? Are the siblings of our solar system different from the siblings of another family around another star and another family around another star? Astronomers first began to get a hint that indeed our solar system is just one possible outcome in the 1990s when we started discovering planets around other stars. We found giant planets orbiting with, around their stars very close, 100 times closer than Jupiter is to our sun. We found giant planets on highly eccentric orbits that take them within a few stellar radii and then out to regions where they could have moons that would have water on their surface. These planets are so different from our own solar system. All our ideas about how the solar system formed, how it got started, had to be revisited. We had to throw out all those ideas and start it new. What theories could explain both our own solar system in all the detail we understand it, but also the great diversity of planetary systems we're finding around other stars? The next humongous step forward in that journey was in March of 2009 when NASA launched the Kepler spacecraft from Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. It's a one-meter space telescope, significantly smaller than Hubble. But whereas Hubble stared at one small field for 15 days, the Kepler mission is going to stare at a field bigger than my hand for three and a half years, making an observation once every 30 minutes of hundreds of thousands of stars. By getting into solar orbit above the Earth's atmosphere, it can measure the brightness of stars very precisely. And that field of view is going to observe these stars and see if any are twinkling. Not from our Earth's atmosphere, like when you observe the sky, but rather from a planet that just so happens to pass in front of its host star and cast a shadow over the Earth and the Kepler spacecraft. Every image you get from the space, Kepler Space Telescope looks like this one. It may look like kind of a smudge, but actually, if you zoom in, you'll see that there's tons of stars in each little patch. It's over 100 million pixels. That's many more than our projector can show, so each pixel on the screen is actually hundreds of pixels. We're now looking at all those stars, but yet we have to observe once every 30 minutes and to watch to see if there'll be a planet orbiting that star that will pass in front of the star and cause the amount of white light we observe from the star to decrease very slightly. Maybe if it's a giant planet, maybe it would decrease 1%. We could measure that from the ground. If it's an Earth-sized planet, it would block one ten-thousandth of the star's light. By observing the decrease in the star's brightness, we get information about the size of the planet, how far away the planet is from its star, and then we can make inferences about the temperature on that planet. So the Kepler Space Telescope is staring at these 100,000 stars, trying to determine how common are Earth-sized planets. 
This is a, a gallery of the first 1,200 or so planet candidates identified by the Kepler spacecraft. Some of them you can see the little black disk showing how large the planet is on top of the star to give you an idea of the size of the star and its temperature from its color. But most of them, you probably can't tell that there's anything on top of it. That's because turning off one pixel of my screen would be similar to the amount of light that's blocked by that planet. We found some pretty astounding systems. One example of a bizarre system for the first time is a planet, a Saturn-sized planet, that's orbiting not one star, but two stars, and passes in front of both of them. So we can measure the differences in how much light is blocked, the spacing, the size, and learn about this planet's mass, radius, density, in enough detail to learn about what it's made of. There's now three systems like this that Kepler's discovered, and we're searching many more stars to see if there are additional systems like this. Just from these first three detections, we can tell that there are tens of millions of these in our own galaxy. Another cool system we've discovered is six planets that pass in front of the host star. Each planet orbits around its star. that separation is closer than Mercury in our own solar system. And yet these planets have masses of 10, 20 Earth masses, comparable to Uranus and Neptune in our own solar system. There are a new class of planets for which we have no analog in our own solar system. Larger than the Earth, smaller than Neptune. It's a pretty big gap from one Earth radius to four Earth radius, one Earth mass to 18 Earth masses. And what lies between those? Are those planets mostly rocky like the Earth with maybe a little bit of gas around them? Or are they a rocky core with a big extended atmosphere of hydrogen and helium? Interpreting these cases where we have multiple planets passing in front of the same star is quite complicated because instead of just seeing one pattern that repeats every time, we have different stars, different planets passing in front of the star, causing the amount of light to decrease by different amounts, the duration, different amounts. And you have to, to look at it and go, hmm, there's one dip, but the next one's not the same. And another one, less of the same either. Is it going away? Is it going to disappear soon? It does disappear. Oh, wait, wait, one of them came back. Okay, that, that one might go with that one. And then, then you start to unravel this cipher to figure out all the planets in the system that all happen to be aligned, their orbital planes, that not just one of them, but all of them pass in front of their host star. In cases like this, there's another really cool game we can play. If there were just one planet passing in front of the star, well, its orbit would follow Newton's laws of motion and gravitation, Kepler's laws of planetary motion, and the orbital period between when the planet passed in front of the star would be a constant. We could use the times at which the planet passes in front of the star as a clock. Tick. Wait a few days. Tick. And that clock would allow us to, to learn about the separation of the star from the planet. But now imagine not just one planet, but two, three, four, five, six planets around the same star. Well, now their gravity is not just interacting with a star they orbit, but also with each other. And so one planet tugs on the other one and causes it to speed up along its orbit and pass in front of its star a little bit early. And then afterwards, well, then the planet tugs in the other direction and causes the planet to slow down. And then the next time it comes around in front of the star, it may show up a little bit late. And the amount by which those planets speed up and slow down their orbits is related to the strength of the gravitational tug of the planets and therefore their masses. Remember we mentioned the size of the planet from how much light was blocked. Now we learn about their mass from these interactions between the planets. And collectively, we can use this to learn about their densities, like Archimedes dipping the cr crown into his bathtub. Well, once we learn about the density, we can start to ask about what's the planet made of. The one technical slide for the talk shows the mass of the planet on the horizontal axis and its radius on the vertical axis. The curves show our models for planets of similar compositions. So that the top curve shows you a model that has nearly all hydrogen and helium with uh, a little bit of a rocky core. The bottom curve shows you an Earth-like composition with all rock and just a very thin little layer of atmosphere on the top. And you can see that those nice blue ovals show you the, the regions that are, are measurements for the mass and radii of five of those planets around the system Kepler-11. You can see some are both Neptune size and Neptune mass. But others are, are several Earth masses, but only a little bit larger than the Earth. 
Another system we, we studied in a different way, Kepler-10, we even measured its density so precisely that we're confident that the planet is mostly rocky. Now, it's mostly rocky, which is pretty cool, but it's also so close to its host star that its surface is incredibly hot. It might even be molten. So as the Kepler mission goes on, we are finding more and more planet candidates, thousands of them at this point. We're confirming some of those planets using various techniques, such as the gravitational interaction method I described earlier. And in the last few weeks, we've increased the discovery of multiple planet systems that transit in front of their star, from a few shown in red to, to all those shown in green as well. And in the coming years, as Ke the Kepler mission finishes its three and a half year primary mission, hopefully for several years beyond that, we'll be able to identify more planet candidates and confirm more of them using this clockwork uh, interaction of the different planets. Fortunately, there's many of these, not just a few dozen planetary systems that we can study, but there's over 300 planetary system candidates. We'll be analyzing them with similar techniques to these first, uh, first few dozen and using a variety of techniques, ground-based telescopes, Large telescopes are able to study the light of the host star in, in great detail to measure the star's motion towards and away from us, as well as with the Kepler spacecraft itself, measuring the times of transits, so that it's able to characterize these planetary systems and learn more about them. Step back a bit and ask, well, what all has Kepler found besides these few really exciting systems? Well, there's a few planets, a few hundred planets, that are roughly the size of Jupiter. These are comparable to what we knew about before Kepler launched. But then the frequency of planets skyrockets as you go towards Neptune-sized planets. Then it starts to taper off. But that taper off is because Kepler is staring at lots of stars. And it's only able to detect Earth-sized planets around some of the brighter stars for now. And as the Kepler mission continues, uh, for hopefully for several more years, it'll be able to detect smaller and smaller planets around more and more stars. And so based on our understanding of the sensitivity, we actually expect the frequency of planets is rising all the way to Earth-sized planets. Some of the highlights in looking towards small planets, this January, the Kepler team and also collaborators using the uh, Kepler data were able to discover planets the size of Earth and even some planets nearly the size of Mars. Now, in addition to pushing towards small planets that are primarily rocky and of surfaces, kind of similar to our own, we're also imagining looking towards other planets that are further away from their host stars, and these first ones we found, because once they get further away, they're cooler. And if they have a nice rocky surface, they could have liquid water on their surface. We call the range of, of separations from the host star to the planet where you, a rocky planet could have liquid water on its surface, the habitable zone. Because on Earth, all life uses water at some stage of its life. Eventually, we want to search for Earth-sized planets, rocky planets, in the habitable zone of solar-like stars. Right now, we have none. But it's within the capabilities of Kepler over the next several years to detect those planets and even to measure some of their basic properties like their size, mass, density, and learn a little bit about their composition. And that's really just the first step. Because once we know how common these planets are, then we can think about building telescopes to go look out beyond the our own solar system to find planets that we could study, study their atmospheres, try to learn about them, uh, with other telescopes. NASA is already planning uh, a couple of another, other observatories. One, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, to do a similar type of study, but on bright stars. And uh, a second satellite, Finesse, that would be able to study the atmospheres of the host stars by staring into uh, some of these if we were able to find them around closer stars. All of these discoveries are quite exciting. And we're eventually working towards trying to find the uh, frequency of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone. And I want to invite you all to be able to join that hunt. There's a website, planethunters.org, where you can go and see real Kepler data and draw a little box whenever you see what looks like a planet passing in front of its host star. There are some tutorials to help you get started. Um, but this, this is a website is, is really an initiative towards citizen science. There's hundreds of thousands of stars. They're being observed every 30 minutes. And there's a lot of data. We've written fancy computer algorithms to try to search for these planet candidates, and we found over 2,000 of them. At the same time, the computers can only find what we tell them how to find. 
And the human eye, anyone, don't have to be trained as an astronomer, can recognize, hey, there's a little dip, and there's some other complicated stuff going on, but I see that pattern of little dips. And so we're using citizen scientists to recognize these, and they've identified multiple planet candidates that were missed by the standard mission computer algorithms. And they're helping us understand how complete our search, search is, if we're missing any plants, and also helping to find some new ones. And eventually that feedback cycle where we then revise our computer algorithms in order to improve our ability to find small plants, despite all the complicated things that can go on with stars, star sparks, binary stars, pulsating stars, variable stars. Not all of them are quite this simple. Of course, all of this uh, is, is the work of a, a great team, both at the University of Florida, uh, graduate students, postdocs, even some undergraduates contributing to our understanding of how plants form, how the solar system fits into the big picture, and generally expressing that curiosity to answer age-old questions that people have had for hundreds or thousands of years. And, and finally, the entire Kepler team that's been able to go from the idea that was first thought of in the early 80s, proposed and proposed and proposed again, and like you heard earlier, sometimes when at first you try, you don't succeed. And there are people on this team who have made an entire career of seeing this mission uh, be able to go from an idea to launch to now helping us find the first Earth-sized planets transiting solar-type stars. Thank you.